Hi British Vogue, I'm Dua Lipa and I'm so excited to be chatting today with the wonderful, the lovely, the blessed Madonna, also known as Maria Stamper, who I've been <laughs> working with um, on my new remix album, Club Future Nostalgia, which we've created during lockdown. And I'm so, so excited that it's going to finally, finally be out and um, you guys get to hear it. And this is kind of an introduction for me into a new world, which um, I'm excited to talk to you, Maria, about it even in even more depth because I feel like I've learned so much from you through this whole process. And uh, yeah, I guess let's just start with lockdown first. How's that been for you? <laughs> you know, I'm one of the people, for, well, first off, I just want to say I feel like I've learned more in this like two and a half, or I don't even know time. It's a, it's a question to say that time has lost all meaning but what month is it what day is it i have no idea anymore um and i felt like i just it was like no idea i the other day i woke up and i totally got ready to like do a bunch of stuff and i realized that it was sunday and um which i guess is a very common experience at this point but um you know i learned so much just from doing this and i think that if i had not had this project that um I probably would have actually had to go into the loony bin. <laughs> it was it was definitely a, a therapeutic thing and also just to be kind of thrown into the deep end on something um, where we were all working remotely and yeah. working on a big team without being in the same room was insane. Crazy and surreal and I, and I keep describing it as like a once in a lifetime kind of experience because for me I don't think I would have ever had the chance to create something like this um if it wasn't for for a time like this you know if we weren't all at home and we weren't you know if everybody wasn't available because you would have been on tour you would have been doing your thing all these producers and artists and everybody would have been so busy and to kind of everybody had to, to have everyone sitting at home and kind of down to work on this project and be up for it was really surreal um like have you found that this has been like a good kind of creative reset moment for you it, it has, and, I, I, and one thing, you know, I was kind of watching, it's so funny because as I was coming home or running from tour, which I think a lot of us did, were kind of out there and then things were, things were, were happening that it was like, you know, okay, is this really happening? Are we going to have to cancel this whole period in time? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I was, I, I had been in Australia and as I was, of course, I had no idea that this was going to happen with us, but as I was running home, I kept seeing your uh, makeup campaign in, <laughs> in the airport, <laughs> and it's one of the things that I remember constantly being everywhere at that moment, and then to have this kind of happen, it was sort of just a completely clean slate in a way that I had never had before. You know, and I, did you, did you feel that way? Was, was this, this is probably the most downtime you've had? In, in ages. I literally can't remember the last time, that, especially while I was in London. I was like, I can't remember the last time I spent that much time. I spent four months in London, literally at the, I, I hadn't done that in probably five, six years. And to have all that time, especially at a time when I thought I'd be at my most busiest, releasing my album, kind of preparing for all that stuff. And um, it just, yeah, everything kind of stopped. And it was, it was thinking of interesting and fun ways, thinking outside the box to kind of make this album, you know, I don't know, make it, make it fun and interesting in different ways and create different things um, with it. I know one thing for me that's been, you know, that I've missed a lot is kind of going out and going out to parties and clubs and dancing and maybe hearing my song like on the radio or playing in a bar and getting like super excited. And I, I, I really, I miss that, you know, alongside the touring, it's also that kind of human connection. Like, do you feel it's been the same way for you? Yeah, the thing that I, you know, I, I had been on break before I took my first break in like seven years and my husband and I went our, on our honeymoon because I had been on tour when we got married and um which is just crazy like we spent our um we spent our uh, our honeymoon when we first got married in uh in Berkine in Berlin and uh, <laughs> it, was, it was good um but you know we had never 
we had just really never had a period in time where life was not going very quickly. And, you know, uh, I, my life changed very much in a short period of time. I was, you know, it's a, a, a 20 year overnight sensation. And, um, so when things happened, I didn't have any choice but to go to work all the time. And I felt like it was like a moment to step up and that's what I did. And finally we had taken a break and gone to Bali and which was wonderful. You know, we did nothing but eat beautiful fish and swim naked in the pool and all the things. We went to the monkey jungle and, you know. I went to the monkey jungle once. You know, did you go to the monkey jungle? <laughs> Not joking, I got bitten by a monkey there. So magical experience, but I feel you. Yeah, I had one stand next to me and I thought it was going to get me for a second, but uh, we just had a nice photo opportunity with me and this old man monkey. Um, but, and then I went on tour and um, it just, it, it was just, I had never, I've never experienced anything like this. I've been working since I was 15 years old. And so it was just like overnight I was home. And I didn't, I didn't know how, like, there were so many basic life things that I was like, cooking? <laughs> you <Yeah>. know? <laughs> I know, I did so much cooking. More cooking than I ever thought I'd ever do in probably my whole life. I don't know, I just, um, especially when everything's so accessible, like you go out, you quick, quickly grab a bite, you go out, you see some friends, you go home, you, like everything's just so easy. But then I, I, I actually really, really enjoyed it. I got into the whole thing of like having groceries delivered at the door and then oh, just yeah. cooking everything. I got into lentils. I was learning about how to cook all kinds of interesting meals that would take like three hours to cook, which is the only time I've ever done that is when I cook like Christmas dinner or something. Same. Like never have I ever done anything as extensive as during quarantine because it was like an activity to do. <laughs> how much are you loving your dog? How is Dexter? Oh my God. I'm, we're so in love with him. It's been the best thing during quarantine. I mean, it was crazy because obviously with like, with our life, we're constantly traveling. I'm always like, no pets right now. It's just not the right time. It's not the right time. And then lockdown happened and all these adoption places were putting you know they're posting all these dogs and all these dogs need homes and you know maybe we could foster a dog and we just like it just went from maybe we could foster to this one's so cute and we just have to have it and he is so cute and small and he looks like a labrador but he's like a chihuahua dash and mix Aww. he's gonna say small so i'm like okay he'll be the perfect top up when the time comes um so yeah it's been it's been great he's like our best cuddle buddy and just the cutest tiniest companion um so wonderful having having it's so funny how like all the things that you just wouldn't even that you know are important but things just really magnify it in importance in a way that I didn't really expect like my dog became kind of the center of my universe and I fell in love with my husband all over again and my parents who I haven't been able to see but it, just that connection you know calling my mom every night before bed I never did that before. yeah it's it's it, it gives like different things like such a such a crazy importance and you really understand that this kind of slowing down and taking a step back and really remembering what is the most important thing um and yeah. like it's been, I think for those reasons, it's been amazing. Um, but anyway, let's talk about Club Future Nostalgia. Let's do it, let's get into it. Uh, I've admired your work for so long and it was such an honor and a delight, first of all, for me to be able to reach out to you and see if you were into like doing this project with me and for you being like, just for you agreeing and wanting to do it with me was just mind blowing. So I want to say thank you so much. Oh my God, are you kidding me? I, 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 my dream come true. This is like, it, it's so cool to get to work with you and to to just see you work and the, the things that you do and learn from you. It's been, it's been magic. So thank I you. felt exactly the same way. I, I feel like seeing how, you, how your record was constructed um, and just to hear some, sometimes, you know, just even isolating your vocals and listening to how good they were. And, and, you know, when you spend a lot of time with something, um, at that kind of architectural level, 
Um, I think you see things in it. And I, we listened to the album all the time before that. And so it was, a, it was really a shock and a pleasure to, to get to do this. But hearing it in that way and hearing, you know, being able to look at the bones of it, um, it just, honestly, there's nothing else that I think this would have worked with. And so it was just such an honor for me to get to look at that to look at those pieces. And I, I don't understand how you're only 25 because the album is so, it's just so thoughtful. And um, one of the things that I love about pop music and that I love about women in pop is that I think so many times really heavy messages and really brilliant things are delivered in a way that people don't expect. And it's one of the reasons that I think maybe women and young women in particular don't get as much credit as they deserve as writers. But just getting to spend time with those lyrics and the way that you made it just made me fall in love with everything in a way that, um, you know, it, it just, it changed me as a, as a producer for wow. sure, forever. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I really wanted to feel like a, like a strong female empowerment project, you know, also along, uh, alongside, you know, the, especially because when I was thinking about future nostalgia and while I was creating the record, I tried to work with so many different like female artists and songwriters and trying to get that. So getting to, to create this with a legendary, amazing female producer, um, was really a dream come true. I mean, for me, it was, there were so many like bucket list things that I did with this project that just like, I, I feel like I ticked off that I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I get to do this. And then, oh my God, I can't believe this artist is gonna be on it. Like, did, did that feel like for you after being like in the industry for so many years and like, I guess working with so many incredible people, like do you still have those pinch? Moments and oh, crazy. for sure. And, and I think there was a lot of times where I, one of the things that made me so happy was when, uh, um, you know, when I could really feel your excitement about something. I think, you know, we both flipped out very much about, I think, Missy in particular. That was a big one where we were like, yes, you know, or, and, when, <laughs> and when, when Gwen came through and those things, um, you know, and there were so many things that when it was, when it was starting, I thought, well, I'm just going to like ask for things that I thought I, I didn't know if it would be anything that anybody would, would even go for. And to find out like, oh, well, we already actually approached that person for a remix. And so yeah. you know, there was a lot of things that were on my wish list that were already on the way. And that's how I knew that it was going to be, that it was going to be really good. For a big part of it, like we were bouncing off ideas and stuff, but a lot of what my job was pretty much done. You know, I, 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 all I had to do was kind of send in my vocals and kind of talk about my inspirations and, you know, give certain ideas and really just give feedback. So I feel like I kind of had the easiest job of all, but how hard was it like doing this in lockdown? Like how hard do you think it was, or did you feel it was to like get everyone together and like, you know, mold the whole thing and piece it together. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I'm not gonna lie, it was pretty detailed because, uh, you know, it was an album that already existed, but then as you know, we stripped it down into pieces and then worked with loads of other people. And then on, and then after that, um, you know, it wasn't just, I think if it had just been remixes or if it had just been a mix or whatever, all of those things separately would have been a, a massive task, mm -hmm. but to, to do everything and then also break it down into like, um, into its parts and reassemble it. it. It was a really, you know, infinitely detailed task. And, um, and I felt also like, because I was home and I was alone and I was the only one that could kind of do, do anything, you know, I didn't have any, I didn't have anybody to, to ring 911 if something didn't work right or, or, yeah. or whatever um that I wanted to like really go for it and, and put in those little fine details and to not just mix it but totally recreate it and you know like the fantasy world of it because it's one of the few things that you could really do that with yeah I mean I, I thought about it I, I was I, I mean it, it's when I was thinking about it I was thinking about records 
you know, like Paul's Boutique and, and things that Prince Paul had done and, and, you know, those kinds of records that um, have all of these layers to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately, pretty much everything came together, but it, it was, it was complex. There was, you know, I was breaking up yeah, the slide rule. I know, there were, there were bits in that that I was just like, whoa, even like from one song going into the other. And I just thought everything in, in itself was, was, you know, very magical for me to like listen and also hear these songs like reimagined and put together. It was, it was surreal. So, um, I'm really I, sure you let me do it. I have to, I, honestly, the, the most shocking part out of all of this is that, um, is the fact that it, that, that you let me have the latitude that you did. And, you know, for that, I'll always be grateful. Oh my God. Are you kidding? You're a mastermind. I couldn't have done this without you. Honestly, you've, you've just, um, you've curated my dream, like dance album. And, and for that, I'm, you've, you've really brought the nostalgia to my future. And, and for that, I'm so grateful. Um, yeah, suddenly we're going to have to be in a real club. Everything that I'm doing is like a manifestation to try and get us out as soon as possible. And like, that's, uh, <laughs> that's really my goal. Um, what's your, what's your favorite track on the record? That is a hard, well, I'm going to ask you, what is your favorite track? It's. It's really tough. I, I love levitating, um, of course. I love um, Break My Heart Yeah. Uh, with the Jamiroquai sample in it. I love uh, Love is Religion, the remix, but I guess people also haven't heard the original yet. So I know, that's, right? um, that's also really exciting. And um, I don't know, I, you know, I, I love the, I love Future Nostalgia, the Joe Goddard remix. Like everything is so different and has its own thing. Like it's it's really, really hard to choose. I mean, even pretty please. I don't know. I'm not, I can't. It, I just, I love them all. What do you think? What's your favorite? I'm in the same boat. I have a, I, there's a few that, that I, the only way that I can kind of rank them is by how long I get them in my head. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I had, there's, there was like, there was a Moody Man week and there was like two weeks of Midland and Jada G had her moment and the Jen Hashino gets in there. Yeah. I love, I love in Jen's remix, all of the little, uh, the way he plays up, they already the sort of tongue in cheek moments. And mm -hmm. then I tried to go even further with that. Um, that was the one that I think I had the most fun with. I loved the humor of it and I loved the the playfulness and I kind of wanted to like, I don't know, make that even further. And so, you know, there's a section where I beeped a word that's not dirty and things like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So but it, it's hard to say. It's like picking, it's like picking your favorite child, you know, do you feel like you can have any kind of like objective relationship with it or have things, have things morphed over time? Do you, do you hear it differently now than when you first made it? Um, I feel like the songs over time constantly evolve, you know, especially when you start thinking about like how it's going to sound live or different performances that you're going to do. I feel like every time I try and like do something different. So I'm never so married to, to like the final version. Of course, like that's the way that I, I, I present and I want people to hear it, but I feel like music is constantly evolving. And I also have this thing where I'm like, I'm really, really precious until the moment it comes out. And then the second it comes out, I'm like, it no longer belongs to me, it belongs to everyone else. I, I feel like that's how I feel like I allow music to constantly evolve. And even as an artist, I feel like I, I try and grow by not holding on to the past so much um, musically. And I think that's yeah, been one such a personal record that must be hard, hard to do because I mean, the, you know, I think sometimes you hear a song on the radio and you know that it's just kind of come out of a machine and it, it doesn't have that thing. And one thing that there's that you really defy is, is that kind of when you sound like no one else. And when you talk about things, there's no question that it comes from your real life. And I, you know, that I, I have wondered, you know, how that, how it must be to kind of have your, your diary in public like that. It's scary. 
Um, <laughs> a little bit, it's a little bit nerve wracking, but it's something that I always tell myself in the studio that I just need to kind of write whatever I feel, not hold back, as long as I'm in kind of in, in, in a room where I feel comfortable and safe to be vulnerable, then I can get the best out of myself. And then I'm like, you know, what other people think, or if people think it's about them, or if people can figure out who it's about, or what the situation is, that, you know, art is meant to be subjective, so I have to let them just have that. If I want to be really honest about my music and my stories, I have to be vulnerable. I have to speak about my experiences, no matter how, like, scary or painful they are. So sorry. Don't be, it's adorable. He's just found his bark, so he's like, um, he's being very protective of the. Oh, that's so cute though, it's really sweet. You know, I know for, for me, like there was all kinds of reference points when I was doing stuff that, that I was thinking about, but when you made it, were there artists that you were, that you were thinking about? Like, you know, were you trying to, to, are there any kinds of moments in particular that you felt like, um, were an homage or that you were trying to, to tap into? Oh yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I made this whole album based on like a feeling of a memory. It's like music that my parents listened to while I was growing up, like Jamiroquai, Blondie, Maloko, Prince, David Bowie, um, the good stuff. Madonna, of course, like all these incredible artists and it was, it, it's kind of that feeling that when you're at home or when you're like with your family and the song comes on and everybody sings along at the same time and it always like brings up like good memories and everybody's just getting on and I was like, wow, how cool would it be to like try and recreate that feeling into something that's quite modern and new but still gives you the feeling of something nostalgic and that's where I got the name Future Nostalgia. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the merging of two worlds but it was all based on one childhood memory feeling that you get that can always be replicated no matter how many years down the line it always gives you that same feeling it always takes you back to where you were when you heard that song for the first time and and that was um kind of the the, the whole thought process behind it but what about you who are some like who, who are some people in music that you look up to or reference in your in your stuff well, you know, it, it's interesting because uh, in, in some ways, I think in, in working on Club Future Nostalgia, I was kind of going through the same process that, that you were then um, because the concept itself really hit home for me. And um, so when we started talking about it, I, I wanted to, to try to reach some of those places also um, because I, I, when I listened to the original album, I felt like you are um, at this moment where you have stepped into your power and this kind of, um, this amazing thing that happens with women in pop and this beautiful, lineage of of women that make these records that have depth uh, but they're communicated in a in a way that that makes sense to very young people and older people and it's just it's a it's a moment that happens generationally and a few people step into that moment um in at at, at any generation and so i was thinking about that and and i was thinking about you know, who some of those other people are. And of course, Madonna is one of those people for me, Missy Elliott, when some of the people that were sampled on it, you know, Stevie Nicks. And then if you think about it at like a global level, like, you know, obviously the, the black paint track is in there. And so those are things that I really love and that I, I, I hold pop music to be um, the very highest form of art in, in many ways. And I think that a lot of times, I think especially because women really dominate it, that um, the, the depth of pop is discounted. And I also think that that plays an important part in the story of dance music. I mean, Madonna made very serious dance records. Yeah. They're not a joke. <laughs> the, you know, physical attraction is a banger today. Yeah. <laughs> 100%. Uh, like, a, like a prayer might be the best record ever made. Uh, 
One hundred percent. You know, Missy Elliott, all these things, and so part of what it was for me was trying to to rectify that that feeling. I wanted it to be, yeah, it's a story about clubbing over time and that feeling of nostalgia for the club, but it's also about what where women fit into that and. Um, of course, there were other things like from a dance music perspective, I was thinking very much about like Masters at Work because they've done a million incredible remixes. And, uh, you know, of course, Metro Area, the who I, everything I've ever made is kind of a love letter to, to them and, and Moloko and, uh, you know, all, all, all of those things. I think we had a, a lot in common and, and also just oh, the dog. Um, <laughs> I just throw him like he's biting my finger. Ooh. Like, oh, uh, but yeah, I think there were a lot of things that 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 we cared about that were that were the same and that I wanted to to touch on. But especially, you know, thinking about like all the good work that Masters at Work have done and um, and people like that, for sure. You know, what was the first album you ever bought? The first album that I I probably asked for was Michael Jackson, but. I'm from a different generation, so I think everybody my age, pretty much, Michael Jackson Thriller was the first one that they asked for. But I had an uncle who was very cool, and uh, who even before that gave me a lot of probably inappropriately good records for a child. Really? Uh, yeah, I think my first one was like Talking Heads, uh, Speaking oh, in wow. Tongues, when I was like five or something. So, or oh six. my god! Okay, very cool, uncle. Yeah, very cool, and like. <laughs> Elvis Costello and my mom and I were in love with Prince and you know all of that kind of stuff uh I was I was lucky it sounds like you had cool or I, I mean anybody that has ever seen your parents on the internet knows that they're actually yeah. super cool and I also have cool parents which is like a major advantage yeah did you feel that way like hearing good music at home was 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 helpful to you oh my god it was it's it's the reason why I do what I do it really I mean if it wasn't my parents playing music around the house and constantly teaching me about different artists or playing music that even sometimes like if I wouldn't know the name of it and I'd hear the song I could sing it you know front to back and then I get even more interested and I'm like I've learned this song and I know this from being so young but I didn't know who sang it and I would just get so interested in music and I have so many like musical references because of the music that my parents like played at home and that I listened to but my my first ever record was um, Whoa Nelly by Nelly Furtado. Yes. Um, that was, that just kind of changed my whole life. That was like, okay, pop, pop, pop. It's all about pop. And then I went and bought Misunderstood by Pink. Oh, Pink is so good. So good. And then I was, I was randomly in like, um, just kind of like a public library that I would go to and like do like some revision or go and play and like, I don't know what I was doing. It's like a public library and that you can go and like basically rent out CDs and stuff. So I was just kind of going through them and having a look and I see pink on the cover of one. And I'm like, oh my God, she put out a new CD or whatever. And it was her first ever album. It was like R&B pink that can't take me yeah. home. Forward. And I got so obsessed with that version of pink that then I was just going back and forth between like misunderstood and can't take me home. And that's when I just started really diving into pop. And then I got, Gwen Stefani's Love Angel Music Baby and that was it. The rest is history. I was obsessed, addicted. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I was like, you know, this is this is the music that I love. But at the same time, doing music and being a musician, although my dad was a singer in a rock band in Kosovo, it was very different to being a, a musician or an artist on a, on a global scale around the world. So it seemed as like like as, as crazy as cartoons on tv like it just didn't seem like it was ever possible or anything it was something that literally i could have only ever dreamed of but it was it was that music that really kind of pushed me and held me through and gave me all these like crazy inspirations throughout yeah my dad is a musician too and uh i, I think that there's a special thing from growing up as the kid of a musician mm. uh and but there's also a really if you kind of go into a world that's different than your parents, there's kind of uh, the the ride that you take them on, I think is particularly special. 
Yeah. Yeah. Your dad must be the most proud in the whole world. It's, it's really, yeah, it's really special. They are, they're really supportive and really excited and yeah. we get to do this all together. You know, they come when they can and come and see me on tour or come and yeah. see different places in the world with me. And, and that's been amazing. And just their support from the beginning, you know, I, I really wouldn't have been able to do this if I didn't have them just being like, you know, you can do this or um, whatever it is. Like you just need to work hard for whatever you want to do. And that, that yeah. was the most important thing like you can uh, you can only get so lucky yeah I think that's a you know I have to say that there were so many distinct advantages that maybe didn't like pay off in the beginning but did in the long run by having a parent who was a musician who had really struggled you know my dad was a nuts and bolts on the road in Kentucky you know I mean slugging it out in a van yeah and um, he's brilliant. He's, I mean, he's a phenomenal musician, but knowing just how hard he had to work even to get just a little bit and, um, and that just to not take anything for granted and to know that you can't just sail in and, and expect anything. Yeah. <laughs> it so really, it, you really do have to work hard and be nice to everybody and, and, there are not a lot of days off and the responsibility of that over time um it's just something that having seen a parent do it just changes everything do you do you feel like you've had any like mentors in this industry like throughout you know your time um and, and up till now that have kind of looked out for you and helped you along the way well, for a long time, I have to say I was kind of in the wilderness because there was a period where there just were not very many women mm -hmm. um, making electronic music. And, yeah. uh, you know, I worked at a record label and I was the only woman in the office and people would tell them that I was their secretary and, you know, that kind of thing. And that went on for years. You know, I was making less than minimum wage living in somebody's basement. You know, that it was like, you know, as hard scrabble um, a music industry story as as you could have. And even when I went to work at Smart Bar, which is such a legendary club, you know, my first job was to kind of like literally pick the chewing gum out of the DJ booth with a razor. <laughs> and, uh, and I, but I just felt like every little step was something that I could do. And I really didn't have like a mentor mentor until I got to Smart Bar. And there was a man named Joe Shanahan who it has has been a, a, a gateway for many people. Um, he, Smart Bar is the, it's the, the oldest dance club in the United States and, and probably the world. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, kind of remained underground and uh, independently owned. And I was the first woman director of the club. And I became a resident at that time. And that really changed things for me in terms of, you know, who I was meeting and things like that. But the owner, Joe, uh, he's kind of one of those guys that, he's like Forrest Gump. <laughs> You know, he's, he's been everywhere, you know, mm -hmm. like, like, um, like Kurt Cobain and Courtney Love met at the club and, you know, he discovered Smashing Pumpkins and it's just the, 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 the venue has just had everybody in and it's not a huge place. And Joe really took me under his wing in a way that changed just my feeling like I could like navigate things. But I was 35 when that happened. I mean, I had had every bad job in dance music that you can have before that. So there was a lot of, you know, hanging on by my fingernails and playing $100 gigs. We call them cheeseburger gigs. Playing cheeseburger <laughs> gigs. You can pay you 50 bucks in a cheeseburger. Maybe. <laughs> it, but it was, I think it, it, it made me really appreciative for, for things when the opportunities did come. And, and you know, I, I, I felt like maybe I didn't have advantages, but the one, nobody was going to outwork me. No mm -hmm. one. And that part uh, I really appreciated. And then of course, as I, I went on, I, the, the rise of women in dance music has been really phenomenal. And I am surrounded by brilliant women producing. And uh, it, that has been wonderful to see and to get to work with people like you. It's just, I, I kind of think that um, everybody that you have the opportunity to work with is a mentor in a way. And, um, that should that has never stopped for me this this project has been a mentorship and uh, you know the things that I've learned just by watching how you do things and 
and and your That's team and everybody. <laughs> and, it's, and it's and rings so true for me as well. I think every experience is some form of mentorship, especially in the in the in the in the process and like creating something with other people. It's you're constantly learning and um that's something I've definitely felt with this project. So that, I love the way you put it. Something I wanted to ask you, you know, yes. dude, you came into this so young at least. In, in, for in as as somebody that um, was much older, I think I felt like even then I was. I'm always like, I need an adult. <laughs> like, can, can somebody come tell me what to do because I have no idea what to do. You came into things so young and were so dominant so fast. What would you tell other young women who are just getting their feet wet in in music? Um, oh my goodness, you know, I, I, I want to try and um, give kind of the best advice possible for anyone that's kind of getting into any kind of creative industry. I feel like when I started putting out music, that was just before I, it was like a day before I turned 20. I really wanted to put my first song out when I was 19. I was like, fuck it, I just want to do it. Wow. So I do it again. But um, wow. I, uh, I don't know, I feel like I lived nine lives before that. It's kind of the importance of just kind of believing in your art, sticking by, um, you know, your music, your artistry, what you put out there. You're always going to have to be the first person to believe in yourself before anyone else. Um, don't let anybody kind of take away your vision yeah. from you or don't let anybody mold you into something that they want you to be because you always have to believe in what you know you put out if you're constantly chasing something or you know you're just like oh well I just want to make music that's going to go on the on the radio or I want it to chart or whatever that's always you're going to put yourself in a very like small bubble and a vicious cycle of constantly trying to recreate some kind of success it's something that I feel like you know a lot of people maybe put some pressure on me after new rules and after the first record and they're like all right well second album you know it's it's got to be a big one and I think if I went to the studio and constantly tried to recreate new rules or something I would never progress as an artist or even as a person or as a writer and so I think the most important thing is just to always you know take the leap be out of your comfort zone but most importantly you know be grounded surround yourself with really good people people around you don't always have to be yes men that's probably a little they do not to be around um but it's well having people who will disagree with you is, is better one of the most important things to put put people around you who will who a do not think you're cool and <laughs> be, <laughs> or who do but are willing to take you down a peg like i think that it's it's so essential uh, yeah. That is a thing, you know, I see people around me in the industry who, uh, who don't have good people around them. Mm -hmm. And what a nightmare that would be. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the hardest thing sometimes to see because you want everybody to like do well and you want everybody to have like the right support system and the, the, you know, the good friends and the family and the team and everybody that just like kind of wants someone's best interest at heart, but you have to be the one that keeps your two feet on the ground and your vision completely like focused and secure. And then that way you can, you know, be open to all those things, but believe in your art and be nice to people because that is it. the most important thing, like always be nice. Like it, it costs you nothing to be nice and polite and lovely and everything, you know, I think a lot of the time that the, the most famous and successful people that I've ever met or that I've come to know during this time have been the nicest and the kindest. And I think that's, um, it's kind of a testament to, to who they are and the music that they make. And for those that you don't hear very nice things, it's probably true. And so it just, you know, it's, um, I think yeah, nice goes a long way. way. It really does. And I, you know, I, something I say all the time with my team is like, is like, you know, I work for you guys and um, it's my job to, to show up and do a better job, hopefully, than you asked for to be nice to everybody, to make sure that everybody knows that I'm grateful and also to be vibe patrol. So, I'm vibe patrol. I have a job. That's the one. <laughs> yeah, you, everybody's, it's got to be good vibes. Yeah. And um, it's been, 
it's been great to work with you and your team because it seems everybody was very much like that. I mean, everybody that was around you, I have to say, you know, not everybody that, uh, sometimes you work with somebody and the people that work with them are not as nice as them. Yeah. And everybody that worked with you has just been brilliant and smart and um, just a joy. It's been a joy beginning to end. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for all your hard work. I'm so oh excited for, this. Yeah, for the chance to, to um, do this. Out into the world and for everyone to hear it. <laughs> it brings so much joy and happiness to my life. And I hope that we can um, get people dancing while everyone's at home for now and hopefully manifest us going into the club soon enough. That's right. We're going to, we're, we're due for, um, for a very serious, very serious night in the club. Needed. <laughs> Maybe we should go back to your honeymoon spot. Let's go to Bergheim. I, I got the I got the hookup. I really, truly, I have the spot. I found the ultimate place. Okay, epic. Good doing it. I love you. Thank you so love much. You and be safe. Take care of Dexter. And I hope you the rest of your birthday week is amazing, and that you get everything that you want forever because you're a precious jewel. Thank you so much. Love you. Thank you, British Vogue. We love you. Love you. Club for your nostalgia coming at ya.